Well, welcome everyone. So great to see everybody here um, to welcome a very special guest, um, Mr. Dikembe Matumbo. Let's have another round of applause for Dikemba taking the time to be here. And uh, before we get started, and I'll, I'll introduce him, but before that, let me just say there are no, going to be another, um, there's no, going to be another opportunity uh, for those of you who think you got a little game. Um, we're going to be over at. <laughs> We're that gonna, would be. Yeah. I'm going to be there too. Yeah. <laughs> Justin's been trash talking him. So that guy right there, that's the one you need to stop. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, Sasha, what time is that over at Garfield? 2.30. 2.30. 2.30. Can you let them know that uh, I brought my shoes too? Oh, yeah. So he I'm brought his ready. game and he brought his shoes. So, um, so we hope to see everyone there. And if you, uh, we have badge to donate uh, stations to help support the work that Dikembe is doing in Congo. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but make sure that you do that um, at the tables here. We'll have them at Garfield as well. All right, well, uh, let me start uh, by just doing a, an introduction of the man who needs um, no introduction. So I'm Jacqueline Fuller, and I run Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy. And um, this is Dikembe Matumba. And he was born in. Dikembe Mutombo Polondo Mukamba Dikensha and Jacqua Mutombo. I thought you was going to introduce me with my nine names. Yeah. Wait, Nick, that wasn't in the briefing. That was not, that was not in the briefing. Okay. Um, can you say that one more time? Dikembe Mutombo Polondo Mukamba Dikensha and Jacqua Mutombo. Right? <laughs> Welcome, Dikembe. <laughs> Um, so a little bit of background. So he was born in Kinshasa and arrived in the U.S. from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I'll just re refer to as Congo, in 1987 on an academic scholarship to Georgetown University. So when he was, I can't believe this is a true story, but tell me if this is true. So when he was in his second year at Georgetown, um, the famous coach, John Thompson, um, saw you and invited you to try out for the university's basketball team. Yes. That's true? Yes. Um, so he played a little ball while he was little at Georgetown. Bit. A little bit of ball. When he was at Georgetown, um, and also found the time to graduate with dual degrees in linguistics and diplomacy. Um, and as a linguist, he's fluent in nine languages. Yes. Wow. So what, what are those languages? I speak English, French, Portuguese, a little bit of Spanish, and uh, other African dialects. Wow. Not too bad. I have a little bit of high school French myself. <laughs> so um, looking at um, his basketball resume, let's start there. So he was drafted fourth overall by the Denver Nuggets. Um, he was an eight-time eight NBA All-Star. He was a four-time Defensive Player of the Year. He had the second most blocked shots in NBA history including, as he told me outside when I let him know I was from Seattle, um, <laughs> 35 block shots against Seattle in like five games, huh, Justin? I, I apologize again for people <laughs> from Seattle. You know. <laughs> I really didn't mean it. Yeah. I think he meant it. I think he meant it. Um, and then you retired from the Houston Rockets in 2009, and just a few months ago was elected to the NBA Hall of Fame. So we have an NBA <laughs> Hall of Famer Thank you. with us today. And in fact, I think we have a quick uh, clip to show of some of those um, blocked shots, perhaps. Oh, <laughs> let's see it. I love to watch myself. Yeah. <laughs> Is all of them against the yellow? Let's hope not. Down the lane, it comes to Oh, yeah. Deep. But Tumbo's in. Tumbo rolls in. Count it, and a foul. This could be his first shot. It is. The Kimpe said no, not in my home. Tumbo goes baseline and throws it down. 
John Kemp trying to do it one on one block. By the Kemp, he reloads it. He knew the Kemp was there. And the tumble with the ball. George cutting his Marley. And the Kemp erases it. To the inside to Baker. Mookie comes to help. The Kemp oh, rejects it. Second all time shot blocker in NBA history. Nice play to Dikembe. Hello. To Rogers again. Great position. Oh, Dikembe flies in and puts it down. One of the great upsets in NBA playoff history. Dikembe Matumbo, one of the great human beings in the National Basketball Association. A guy you can't kind of love. All right. Woo! So Dikembe and I. Um, uh, met recently, we were on a panel together, but um, I was just reminding him outside that actually funny story. When I, when I first met Dikembe, it was several years ago and I was at a Clinton Global Initiative gathering and there was a special meeting for people who cared about the Congo and were doing work there and we were in this like really small, hot stuffed hotel room <laughs> and we were all crammed in there and, and talking about the con Congo and he spoke so eloquently about the work that he was doing there and um, I was so impressed. And uh, I'm on the board of a group uh, that, that works in Congo. And then about a year later, um, I mentioned him to somebody, um, or someone mentioned his name to me. And I said, oh, right, I know Dikembe. I've actually uh, spoken with him, the philanthropist. And they looked at me like, and he plays a little basketball. <laughs> um, so I think from that highlight reel, many of you are aware of, of what he's done in the world of basketball. But you may not be as aware that he is one of the leading global philanthropists and really someone who has set the bar for elite athletes in terms of what it means to give back. So let me just share a little bit about what he's done there. So um, he has visited, for example, Somali refugee camps with CARE, um, an NGO uh, run by Helene Gale, Dr. Helene Gale, a, a mutual friend actually of both of ours. Um, he's worked with the UN, including the UNDP. He's on the advisory board of the National Institutes of Health. He's been a tireless champion for a range of organizations, including Opportunity International, Special Olympics, UNICEF. Um, and in fact, uh, a few years back, the NBA commissioner, David Stern, actually created the first um, created a new position for Dikembe as the NBA Global Ambassador. And so in this role, he travels throughout the world and helping to grow and celebrate the game of basketball um, through several events, including Basketball Without Borders. But he has not only been a champion of other organization and, and is not only the ambassador, the global ambassador um, for the NBA, but he also established his own foundation, which he has given very generously uh, from his own resources. And um, his foundation for more than 20 years has improved health, edu education, and quality of life for the people in the Congo. And in particular, there's a hospital there uh, that you established, and it's named for your mother, Biamba? Biamba Marie. Yeah, Biamba Marie uh, Matumbo Hospital in the Congo. So it's a 170 bed facility. It cost about 29 million to build, and it was the when it was built, it was the first new hospital built there in 40 years. And uh, his hospital has treated more than 100,000 people since it was established. So why don't we roll our second video and get a little more background. Hey, Africa. Africa. Africananga oya ba toa cheveux crepus ba toa maele bo simba ni ba bigé oya bilanga bo simba ni ba Congo simba ni ma bo komo muna le kate o Africa marobate musalande muindo yangolo Africa e mobali yaminga o Africa hatona mo solo Africa. Join us and help us realize our dream, improving health, education, and quality of life. All right, so we've established that Dikembe is a world-class athlete, NBA Hall of Famer. He is a world-class philanthropist. Um, but there's also one other role, potentially, that you might play that people may not be aware of. 
If anything ever happens to the guy that does the voice of Cookie Master, I can sleep at night knowing we have the Kemi Mutombe as a backup. All right, I so. Didn't know that. <laughs> I that sleep better funny. at night knowing that now as well, too. All right, so let's jump into Kembe and just uh, talk a little bit about the work that you're doing. So, um, this, so giving back is clearly a very important part of your life. I heard in a, an interview recently that you've um, brought your kids to um, the, the hospital and work there. So what first inspired you to do this? Because not all professional athletes use their resources and use their spotlight to do this kind of thing. Uh, to me, it was, um, it was something I've seen from childhood. I think I just got sick and tired to see people dying at a young age uh, in Africa. So growing up with, in this, that type of environment where you see people dying all the time, so definitely becoming a natural thing. Uh, mm. That it just happened every day. It was not, nothing else. So when I got a chance, um, to be in the shoes that I am on, I said that I can go and make a difference. Yeah, and you've brought your kids there and made it kind of a family endeavor. Yes, um, I am trying to pass the torch yeah. to my beautiful three children that I have, my daughter and my two boys. I think my wife and I, we are making sure that one day when we are not here, that our, our children can uh, keep on with this great legacy that uh, we have set on and that was passed on to our parents. So yeah. we, I think we're setting up a good example for them. Yeah. So how, you know, as a philanthropist, and, and there's so many causes out there, you know, calling for your attention, how do you choose which ones you're going to do? I, I think you have to look at the cause that touch your heart. So I can, you cannot just wake up in the morning and say, OK, um, I'm going to give my money here or there. But it's always good to give the money on something you believe in. Mm. Uh, um, something that you make, you're making sure that is making a difference, is having an impact in our society. Um, that is becoming very important. I always tell all of my friends, uh, don't just give the money and run away. Hmm. Uh, give the money also want to know where your money is going. That's very important. Uh, I think uh, for me, I knew where I was giving my $25 million, where it was going and what was going to happen to uh, how much difference uh, my money was going to make. Uh, in society, so. When we were on the panel together in Florida, yes. you know, someone asked a, a question about, well, how can I know, you know, an effective organization to give to? And you said, give to mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you essentially said, make sure when you give that you're supporting something where people are visiting regularly. Yes. They're following the metrics and that you have, you know, evidence and proof of, of changed lives for money. And, and you get that through your work? Yes. Uh, and I've been challenging most of my donors, um, yeah. especially those who believe in my vision. Um, it's good for you to give me money all the time. I say thank you so much, but if there's a possibility in your life to spend that you can take even like a one day of your life and uh, take a trip with me where I'm doing my work, that would be so meaningful to me and mm -hmm. to our organization than anything else that you believe in what you're doing then instead of just giving us the money. And that's good. Perfect. Well, maybe we have some Googlers who are interested in um, learning more about your hospital and um, yes. eventually um, going to visit. Maybe put a drone on top of my hospital so yeah. I can see every day what's going yeah. on. Oh, we don't. <laughs> Justin, we're not doing that, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> Justin said we can do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so one of the causes that I know is really near and dear to you also is the Special Olympics. Yes. And um, Google um, is working with Dikembe on this because um, he's going to bring Congolese athletes, Special Olympians, over to the World Games this summer. And we're going to have more than 300 Googlers volunteering. Uh, disability is a big focus for Google.org this year. So um, what would you um, let people know about Special Olympics and why, why it's something you've chosen to invest in? And do you maybe have any favorite stories from your interactions? Oh, uh, first, I'm glad you, you brought it up. I think a Special Olympics is one of the great and wonderful organization for any one of you that can take part of it. Um, I just love the organization. 
Uh, I love those uh, wonderful athletes. Um, I don't call them just the children because um, we do have some of them a little bit older. Um, I love their courage. I love their spirit. Um, I love their parents and the people who are very supportive for, for those athletes mm -hmm. uh, from the day they was born, from their childbirth. And uh, to be there, and I think that will bring me more joy, to just go there and be interact with those young uh, athletes. Mm -hmm. It's great. And uh, for some of you guys who will take time to join us in Los Angeles in July, you will feel it. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm traveling to more than uh, seven countries in July. And wherever I'm going to be, I'm going to have to come back in the U.S. So to take part in the Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to hear that uh, the Googlers are going to be there yeah. and uh, going to take place into this wonderful game that will bring more than uh, 12,000 athletes from around the world. And uh, you will have so much fun. You will appreciate your time you took out your busy schedule to volunteer to that game. And uh, you, will, you will see. Just come see. All right, so let's let's um, talk a little bit more about your hospital and the work yes. there. So, um, was there a, a, a moment uh, as you were even thinking about okay, even to get more specific in my home country, I'm going to do work here, where you were like, okay, it's going to be healthcare, it's going to be this hospital, um, and the way that you've set it up is also unique. You and I were talking about that um, in Florida, that uh, you have figured out that there. Um, there are ways to get some revenue streams because yes. uh, you can get people who need the care to stop flying out of the country to do so? Yes, um, the, the whole idea of just getting the hospital created, the thing that hit me the most was my, my mother's death. When my mother passed away, which was a sudden death at uh, her home, and I realized that um, there was something very important that I can do in this country mm. uh, and make a difference for generations to come. And uh, I went and established this wonderful organization and we went and built a hospital. Uh, we did cost a lot of money. But as the hospital opened in 2007, we all did celebrate, we were full of joy, we were very happy. But we was losing money at the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we was losing a lot of money. Uh, uh, I, we was losing about close to $3.5 million a year. Um, and uh, it was very difficult for me to play basketball in the NBA. And uh, every day, uh, I was forced. Nobody didn't force me, but spiritually, I was forced to raise money every day in every city that I went to. Wow. Either before the game or after the game, I have to come out with at least $350,000 every year, every month, so I can send to come and make sure the hospital stay open. And uh, I did uh, very well with the generosity, uh, with the support of so many people uh, in America. And um, I, can't, uh, I wake up one day, I say, no, I have to stop. We, we have to stop bleeding like this. We have to change the metrics. So talk to a few people, a few of my advisors, including Dr. Aline Gers mm -hmm. and Dr. Kandas, and some of those people who advise me every day. They said, you can be, um, you're going to burn yourself up. You cannot go like this. We have to figure out how the hospital can make money. Then we realized that um, in Congo, uh, most of the corporations, um, telecom industry and the mining industry, was losing close to $49 million a year mm. by shipping all the executives and the top employees to South Africa for treatment and getting a private plane to take somebody who's having a headache or stomach pain. Then I say, but if I can invest more than $80 million on high-tech equipment in the Congo, we can stop losing all this money every year and all those people can come. So we went there and we talked to a couple mining company like Flipo in Phoenix, Arizona, that invest more than $6 billion in Congo. Mm -hmm. And they went and helped us uh, get more high-tech equipment. And today, all those companies are not shipping all their employees uh, in South Africa no more. And they come to us and they pay like $20 a month 
for each one of the employees. Whenever they get sick or whatever yeah. they need surgery, they just get money from uh, the poor. And now we are, you have enough money to run the hospital, to buy the medicine, to keep the hospital running. Uh, it's been uh, a dream come true. Yeah. You know, I can smile today. I'll tell you guys, I was not smiling the first three yeah. years. It was tough, but now I can laugh and enjoy myself and travel yeah. again. Um, and in terms of uh, the challenges that, that you've seen, you've, you've talked about um, how you came up with a business solution. And as someone who's in, in the giving business, you know, at Google.org, I, I can say we love when nonprofits come up with ways that they can sort of cross subsidize or have revenue streams because um, it makes the operation so much more sustainable. But would you say that there's other, um, you know, kind of key lessons that you've learned as a philanthropist that maybe um, the, the Google employees in this room um, might want to keep in mind as they're doing their giving? Yes. Um, I think the great lesson that I learned, I wish as I get older, Maybe I can continue to teach on to those who want to get themselves in a philanthropic world. That do not go in and start an organization don't know how long you're going to keep it going. Um, first, it's not just your money, it's the time. Make sure the responsibility that you have in your life, and your wife or your husband and your children, uh, make sure I've been taken care of and make sure that uh, are you in your workplace, because you, you have to keep working in the life. You can't just stop working and uh, devote yourself for the rest of your life uh, to a philanthropic. Um, um, you will do it, but you, you have to have a revenue that will keep the, the organization going. You know, I sit in so many boards. We raise money on a daily basis, even the Olymp Special Olympic. We have to keep the event going. We have to take care of those young people. Uh, so you, you have to find a way how the money will keep going. And our hospital is surviving today because of all the metrics and all the things that we were able to learn and mistakes that we made. Um, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, today we are happy that uh, we are partnering with so many organizations, including uh, Google. .org, uh, to support us in uh, all the social innovation we're doing, uh, not just by bringing all the Special Olympic kids uh, uh, from Congo to, to Los Angeles, and also Google, uh, the company that we work for, they supporting um, all those uh, doctors from C Internationals who are coming to operate to more than 200 some 50 people who are losing their sight in Congo um, that maybe tomorrow they're not going to be able to see. So there's a great organization in Los Angeles who are flying with their team, with the equipment, everything, and uh, Google.org are supporting that organization so they can come and operating in a hospital for two weeks. So we're happy with this, all those marriage that we are having with all those good people who believe in our vision. Because you will not do it by yourself. Mm. That was my mistake. Mm. At the beginning, when I started building the hospital, I was like, oh, my name is Dikeme Mutombo. I'm a millionaire. So <laughs> I just go cut a check and build a hospital. That's it. <laughs> and uh, the reason I got to that point because I got sick and tired asking ball players for money. And uh, I went to so many of my friends as I was trying to approach them to give me money. Everybody was like, <laughs> they started to see you coming and they, like, they, they see me as tall as I am and uh, they just <laughs> go to a different direction. Dick, I'm not giving you no money. So um, it took them almost about 20 years before some of them decided even to give me $5,000. But uh, that's a different story another day we can oh. talk about. It. We're going to tell that story on the <laughs> But uh, I'm very happy. Uh, for me, any one of you, anything you want to do, even in your community, make sure that uh, you put a great team, that whatever you create, that you will work with other partners. Do not try to do nothing that you believe you're going to do it by yourself. Mm. I have so many organizations now supporting me, and that's the reason why the hospital mm. is running the way.
It's, it's, it's tough to, to run the hospital with 420 doctors and nurses and living in America, not being there, hoping that one day when you come back, all of the equipment is going to be there. It's very tough. Yeah. Okay. Good lessons. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your role um, with sports diplomacy. So you've just gotten back from a visit to Cuba in your role as the NBA's global ambassador. So tell us about that. What, what was Cuba like? Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, I think it's maybe one of my most beautiful experiences uh, yeah. in the last decade. Um, I have so many great experiences before meeting my Nelson Mandela and all of that mm. uh, when he came out from the prison. But uh, going to the Cuba, who would have ever thought that um, NBA and uh, we as a basketball player, we can go today to Cuba and uh, host the basketball clinic and uh, helping those uh, future generation of young Cubans um, to have a bright future. You right. know, um, this is a country that is located almost 27 minutes away from the United States of America, so. Mm. And it's, it's just awful for us, we as an American, to just let all the human beings dying and suffering mm -hmm. because of our political belief. And I'm glad that uh, our commission and, the, and the, our owners made that particular decision that said that uh, we are going to Cuba as part of the cultural change and building a bridge between the Cubans and the America. And uh, it was nothing to do with the government. It was all about human being. I can, we as a human can connect each other with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a great time. We went there for seven days. Uh, we did a lot of clinic. Uh, we refurbished uh, more than uh, six basketball courts. Uh, we saw so many kids who, to see kids in the national team who come to practice every day with no basketball shoes that cost only $20. Wow. It, it, was, it was very sad. Um, we brought like two containers of shoes hmm. and we gave to every kid. And, uh, you can see the smile on their face. You see a kid dribbling the ball. Instead of looking at the ball, he's just looking at his feet. <laughs> oh my God, I got a basketball shoes on. And uh, that's what you want to see. It. You know, you want to see that joy and that happiness. Yeah. Uh, we didn't meet with some government officials. They kind of left us alone. Mm -hmm. But it's something that uh, any one of you um, should go and take that experience. Cuba is not that far. There's about six fly a day right now from the U.S. to Cuba. So feel free whenever you have time, maybe a weekend, just go to Cuba. Maybe for <laughs> Maybe no, you can, No, I'm serious. Um, you can travel to Cuba now with uh, no restriction. For some of you guys don't know. Um, our embassy is opening in the next, uh, maybe eight weeks from now, we're going to have the embassy open. Uh, maybe I believe uh, John Kerry, if he didn't break his legs, he was going to go there very soon. <laughs> but uh, we that should was, be excited. That was biking, not basketball, though, right? That was not yeah. basketball. Yeah, no, that was biking. <laughs> um, so let me go back to something you said a little bit earlier, which is that it, it took a while for you to even talk to some of your friends in the NBA you know, about giving. And there's this, there's this debate about whether athletes you know, are role models or should be role models. Um, I think you probably have a perspective on that. Yes, um, I believe that we, as an athlete, we should be a role model in the society. There's a lot of things that uh, we are responsible for. We are the icon for the next generation come. And uh, we have million, maybe a billion people who follow us on a weekly basis. Yeah. Uh, especially we as a basketball player. And I think uh, for the fact that we wear a uniform, we don't wear um, nothing in our, in our head to cover us like a football players, but uh, people know us by our faces. I think we should be a role model. There's a, there's a lot of things that we can stand on that we can do and make a difference in our society. And, uh, um, and I reject those who come out uh, publicly. Um, I'm not against Charles Barkley, and I love him so much. He's a great guy. <laughs> but I reject the idea that the people who come publicly on TV say that. I cannot be a role model mm. or nobody is more about me because if it's, a, it's all about you, how did you get there? <laughs> right. How did you get to being a great NBA player if you didn't get support from your coaches, your teammates, 
your friends, uh, your high school teacher, your principal, your mom and dad. You did have so many people who did believe in you, who did believe in your vision, who said that I will put my trust in this case. I'm going to put my effort in this child, and I'm going to try to help him to get to the summit where he's trying to go. Because they want to make you an example. So there's a responsibility in each one of us uh, to do it. As one of the, uh, the professors put it in a summit uh, in the AIDS conference in South Africa, he said that uh, when there's a problem affecting one part of the society, it should be a responsibility of every human being living on this planet. Some are every human being living on this planet. Some are we have a role to do, we have a duty to fulfill for other human beings. It doesn't matter which part of the world, which part of society that you live in or you work in, there's always a place for you to contribute, to be an example. So these are the great examples that I'm giving to each one of you. Don't say that because I work here in this beautiful, magnificent campus. I don't have no role outside of this campus. You do. You do. You're a role model, too. Not just the Kimmy Mutom. Uh-huh. <laughs> so are there any, um, any players or people that you would call out as people who are doing it well? Um, yes. Um, uh, the best of them, I would say, today, um, Who's, who's really following almost 99.9% of my footsteps, I would say Yao Man. Oh, yeah, from China. Um, to see how much resources that the young man have devoted himself um, to more than 1.2 billion people in China. He's building schools, um, he's building a bunch of uh, sport academies, um, is building recreation center for after school program. Uh, I thought I was doing enough. Uh, <laughs> as raising being, mistakes? A, as being tall as I am, but <laughs> to see another guy who's kind of taller than me, <laughs> you know, almost a seven foot seven, that I can look up. Wow. And I say, no, that's my role model. Wow. So, there's I, another man that Dikembe actually has to look up to. Yes. Oh, there's a few of them. Yeah. I'm not the tallest guy, you know. I'm a little bit tall, but I see tall people every day. Uh, but I'm very glad that he's doing, you have uh, Lua Dane, who's playing for the Miami Heat. He's, uh, he's doing so much in Southern Sudan. You have Alonzo Mourning, he's doing so much in Miami. Uh, you have LeBron James, he's becoming very devoted right now for the, the city of Akron, also the city of Cleveland. Um, we have so many other young, uh, you have um, other kids are coming on. You have Kevin Garnett and uh, um, Serge Ibaka and all those young kids who are coming for the new generation are trying to keep up with my footstep and we're so happy that uh, so many of our players today are stepping up. They, they came to understand that this game is good, we make money, but we have to make a difference mm. in our society because I would not gonna be sitting on this chair that you put me in, not just because of the game of basketball. There's all the things that you appreciate about me and my personality, right. and that's the reason why you, you guys brought me in this beautiful campus, and I think uh, uh, we want our players to be that, to be that model. Um, just, um, do what you can do, because you cannot be here forever. All right, so NBA Finals start tomorrow night. Um, I'm going. So, <laughs> so I was going to ask, um, who's your pick? And you have to be gentle. Be, and remember, we've got a lot of Warriors fans, perhaps, in this room. You know what? I, I apologize that I cannot predict uh, who's going to win. <laughs> Not just because I'm a basketball player, but uh, I work for the commissioner office. Ah. <laughs> As ambassador, one does not pick teams. All right, we're going to go with so Warriors. I, I, yeah, I have a right to remain silent. All right. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to take my fifth. All right. <laughs> but I wish you guys good luck. You know, uh, <laughs> it's the best for my job. It makes me look good. And uh, 
it will be good if your city win, your team win. Uh, we all gonna be here to celebrate, but I'm just happy it's the best for the game. The, all these ideas are good for the game. All right. <laughs> all right, so um, what does it feel like to block Michael Jordan? Um, you know, I, I have a great respect on, on the game of Michael Jordan, and I have a great respect on Michael himself as a player, as a person, but he was one of those guys <laughs> <laughs> that I always say, this guy's not going to get me. Ah, <laughs> the game well, a little bit of competitive. Yes, uh, you know, uh, I think Michaels were one of those guys that, that made me to be the Kimmy Mutombo. Ah. You know? I just challenged him every day. And it took him about seven years and a half to get one. Wow. <laughs> You know, as wow. many years he played in the league, he only got one. Wow. And uh, I always tell him that uh, he got me because I was late. He really didn't get him. He didn't, ah. you know, he really didn't climb on my Mutombo. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You, know, you, can, you can ask a Seattle I'll Supersonic friend. Yeah, yeah, okay. The Seattle Supersonic friend, they know how they try to yeah. climb over Mutombo. Justin, we're not going to the Sonics, uh, are we? We're just not going to go to the Sonics. All right, I think we have a live question. Yeah, you, you mentioned your vision for the Congo, and obviously the hospital is a huge part of that. But I'd love to hear just more of what is your vision for the Congo. Oh, my vision is that uh, I hope that uh, uh, Congo could have be will become a country where um, people are free uh, to elect their leader, um, where everything can be transparent, and um, where healthcare and mortality rate can go a little bit up. Right now, um, I still have my brothers and sisters, uncle, cousins still living there, uh, my mother-in-law still living there, so, the mortality rate still uh, 42 for men and 43 for women. Mm, so I'd be gone. I, I'm working very hard to see that mortality rate maybe go to 50, 55. And uh, I'm just putting myself as an example. I'm not going to be just the only one doing it. There's a lot of organizations uh, working in the Congo. Uh, we need uh, help from the outside, not just for the Congolese themselves. I think it will take uh, the world community to come together to figure out what's the best way for Congo to move forward. Because um, ca Congo is just a country so rich with the natural resources. Mm. And everyone are, trying, are digging in, trying to, you know, it's not just the Chinese who are there, but you also have the Canadian, the Americans. Um, so Hopefully all of those countries who feel like they can benefit from the Congolese uh, natural resources, they can also invest in the well human being for Congolese people. That's something is missing. Um, the Canadian company, the American company, the Chinese company, and a few European companies, I think they benefit for themselves. They're not putting nothing back. That's so Congo can be a better society and better country. We will see how it goes in the next five years. All right, so this is a question from a Googler named Javier. Um, and Javier says, in ESPN's documentary, Son of the Congo, um, we see how difficult it is for Serge Ibaka to give back to everyone in need. There's only so much he can do. How do you manage to be fair and generous with as many of your people as possible? And this is Javier, who yeah. asked the question oh, right thank here. you. Sorry for your mix. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, they say when you're next, you're next for life, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still love my next, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, Serge is the one person, and uh, he's a young brother to me. I spend a lot of time with him. Uh, he's my father, his dad got a chance to play basketball with my brother my oldest brother, so we know the family so well. He, he trying to do something in the Congo. Uh, but the challenge for Serge Ibaka, uh, he's from both Congos. He's from the big Congo, where is his mother from, 
where you have all of his mom family. Then he, he from the Congo Brazzaville, where is his dad from, where you got all of the family as well. So as being the son of Congo, he's trying to say, okay, where am I going to start on the daddy's side or mommy's side? Where am I going to make a difference? So when the two Congos are claiming him, so he's trying to do his best. And my thing is I'm trying to advise him that he just have to be much smarter and pick the good cause where you can invest and see a good result. But if you can just go and start giving up money here, there, and there, you're not gonna see a good result. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm working very close with him. Hopefully, we're gonna see some success very soon. Uh, with Mobutu Sesaseko gone, and uh, I assume corruption is improving, but could you talk about if you've had to navigate through corruption through your philanthropic efforts? Oh, that's a good question. I think corruption uh, in African continent is never going to be erased, period. Um, those are things that all the international community uh, need to know about. Um, the reason I say that, even Mobutu was very good on that, um, he said, I learned the corruption from you guys, mm. from the international community. He said, you guys cannot come and tell me that I'm corrupt. Um, when it was you guys, the one who came in my country, trying to get whatever we have and trying to pull me on the side at the same time. And I think uh, we, see, we see corruption almost in every part of the society, including here in America. Um, but the thing is when the corruption reaches a different level, and at that when things doesn't look good, but uh, they need to work hard. The government needs to work very hard. Um, the country can be corrupt, but they can always, be, in the same time, they can be other area where there's an advance. And uh, when we was building a hospital, <laughs> I did face a lot of challenge. Uh, we have ministers and. Uh, uh, people in the government on the lower level was coming and say, oh, you're not getting this document, or you're not getting the permit for land or for the construction if we don't see something back, like a kickback. I'll give you an example. Uh, we went to, we have the ground breaking of the hospital in September, September 11, 2001. That was the day that uh, the two planes went to the World Trade Center in New York. So the reason I always say that um, my, my idea survived come from a very difficult time uh, because it was in the middle of the ceremony uh, with the U.S. ambassador, with all of the diplomats mm -hmm. who came with me on the groundbreaking of the hospital before the construction site. We have to stop the ceremony in the middle of the ceremony because all of the U.S. diplomats and everybody or the, from the U.S. government that was with me, you have to leave the site because there were, because it was a terrorist attack. So then I have to stop even my construction for four years, and I stopped the fundraising for, and the hospital was not going to get built. And we didn't start the construction back until 2004, and then the hospital was open three years later. But uh, it's a struggle. Is the struggle that we went through. Uh, in 2004, I went to see President Kabila and I asked uh, Mr. President, I said, um, I'm not starting the construction of the hospital until I get all the documents that I want. He said, but Dikembe, um, you made a promise to the Congolese people you was going to build the hospital. It's been four years went by. There's no break, nothing is happening on the site. What happened? You have all of us on the side there. You make us look bad. I say, yeah, but there's a couple of people here in the lower level are beating me up, are punching me every day. I need all the papers I can. So what we was making sure that if we was going to bring more than $18 million for medical equipment from Germany and the US and uh, other part of the world, we was making sure that those equipment arrive in Congo with no taxes because I was investing million, million dollars to the people and the future of the society. Why the same society were trying to 
tax me for like another ten million dollar. I said, I want to. I'm about to give you guys thirty million dollar medical facility, and you might guys trying to tax me ten more million dollar. I said, let's do this. How about me just stay in America, enjoy my money, and you guys stay over there while people are dying. So the government ended up decided, no, you gonna get whatever you want, and that I got, I got everything I want, and. Uh, I go to Congo every day without nobody bothering me. Mm. <laughs> but I'm glad that you're sharing the struggle because I think sometimes we feel like, oh, well, when I give and when I want to establish this nonprofit and when I want to take on affordable housing in the Bay Area, that should be easy, right? You just mean well and you put in your resources and things work out. So I think this sort of tenacity that you're talking about and the fact that struggles are going to come and opposition and then you have to be creative, you're creative as a businessman. Uh, creative as an operator um, to overcome that. I mean, I think that that makes the story actually even more inspiring to hear. Sometimes you gotta be a little bit mean. And sometimes a little bit mean. Well, yes, when you're doing your charity work, uh, you will get people, even from the city council, from the government, who will try to come push you because you're making. I have people who came to me, even in Africa, say, Do you know what? Thank you for everything you're doing, but you do make us embarrass a little bit. Mm. You do embarrass us because you make us look bad because we, we feel like we are not doing nothing. Every year you always bring all those people here doing all those surgery, and we are not, after you leave, we don't do nothing. People say, okay, how about you? Why you guys are not doing it? So those are the challenges you have to accept and you have to try to live with it. Mm. And do not try to have somebody push you off the cliff and you're far. How would you like to be the person trying to push him off? <laughs> this is the man you, how many? Oh yeah, I got a lot of people trying to push me for the rebound. And I, that time I they know. got a lot of broken noses. I, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Apparently, uh, apparently somebody, it wasn't me, but somebody said maybe like 22 broken noses on the no. other side of that elbow. No, 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 you know what? <laughs> I always get accused <laughs> from being too aggressive. And I think I really didn't break nobody's nose. They ran up to my elbow. They ran. <laughs> Some faces running into elbows. But yes. what you're saying is sometimes even in the charitable world, you got to be a little aggressive. Yes, you, you, you gotta, have to. Yeah. Otherwise, they, they're going to beat you up and take your money and run away <laughs> with So you have, to, you have to practice Dikembe style philanthropy. OK, I love that. Do we have another question? Hi, Dikembe. How's it going? I'm good, um, <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Matty. I'm from Finland. And I just wanted to ask you a question about, um, because something that we see in Europe is that with kind of the countries not doing so well, there's a big rise in countries. There's political pressure of countries not to do as much foreign aid or take in um, refugees. And I wanted to see what your opinion on something that you're doing as a non-government organization versus governmental um, foreign aid, and you know how you see, for example, what's happening in Europe at the moment. Yeah, um, I've been a big uh, advocate about uh, the issue that we are dealing with today about uh, foreign aid. Um, I think it should not be just the European country. Something they have failed as being a student of diplomacy. I think they have given so much aid in account that they will go and get it back. It was not really, not, it was like a debt. They letting an African country borrow money. And I think when they was borrowing money, that money never reached the African people. It was staying just in all those leaders who went to Europe to negotiate from a Paris club, European club, and all of that. That money was staying just in Europe in their bank account. And uh, I don't think we're in a, in a right place really to name all those leaders who talk a billion, billion, billion dollars from the people. But if any countries around the world can go to the continent of Africa or South America and invest in a society and make a difference in those communities and leave few people from the organization then to just watch what they're doing and they hire the community to be responsible or what the, that's what we did, you know. Um, even though I do run uh, the Biamba Marie Mutombo Hospital from the U.S., but we have more than 12 people on the ground, Congolese, that we hire, we train, we made them be responsible for this four, $40 million facility, and they make sure they keep eye on it, they watch each other, 
Um, that's what you have to do, and you have to make sure that the society is responsible. You know, do not just come and uh, open the library, build the library in the neighborhood and the wine. You say, okay, I already gave you a gift. I'm not responsible if the library closed down or what. That's a big failure. Uh, that's what we have seen, and that's why people are tired in Europe right now when it comes to, oh, we need to help the African. And everybody was like, oh, it's been almost 200, 100 years, oh, we've been giving, giving. But you've been giving, who's been following up on that? Mm. It's always good to make people responsible for whatever they get. What they're doing with the money you give to them, they give you a report, and they show you where the money's been spent. And that's what I always want the people. I'll give you an example of my foundation. And I know Jacqueline and Nick know that. <laughs> There's only three people work for me. You see, I run a $40 million facility in the Congo with only three people. And I build a hospital with three people in the No, with two people. We just hired another person like two years ago. So for the past 20 years, I've been running my office only with two staff. And uh, we've been able to get a good result. And we wanted people to know where's the money going. So when you give me your $10,000, I know where's your 10000 go. So I will show you where's your 10000 And um, Europe is just too close in Africa, so it's easy too for the African people to say, I'm going there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. right. OK, I think just our last question. Yeah, one more. One more. Hi, Dukimbi. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, congrats you. on the Basketball Hall of Fame, first of all. Um, my question is, I'm curious, who is the most inspirational person you've ever got a chance to meet in your life, and what was the best piece of advice that they gave to you? That's a perfect question to ask. That's a good question. I, I always say that uh, among every, every people I've met, and I think there's nobody I've ever come close than uh, Madiba. Mm. I think... Uh, Mandela. Nelson Mandela was uh, a great leader, a great father, and a, a great motivator, a great president. Um, he set just so many examples for all of us. And uh, meeting with him for the first time in uh, 92, after he came out from the prison, in uh, the middle of the night, where they have to shut down the entire street light and turned the light off at the hotel because he was coming in, because there were so many people who were trying to kill him back then. It was just tough to know that, to understand that he walk in a room. He said, Dikembe, thank you for bringing your delegation here to South Africa for the future of South Africa. He didn't say, thank you for coming for this nation for now, but he said, for the future, of South Africa. And he told us that, please, keep go doing what you're doing. Do not stop. And do not forget South Africa. And we made a promise to him that we're never going to forget South Africa. We're going to continue to devote our resources and our energy and our money to improve the future of the game and the sport in South Africa for the young people. And we've been doing that for 20 years. Um, we built more than 200 basketball courts. We invest more than, uh, I think, more than uh, 20 some million dollars now. Uh, but his advice, please help my people. Mm. Do not forget, because you are part of the future of this generation, part of the future of the leader. And I think uh, it encouraged me that uh, I'm the leader today in the continent, mm. and I continue to set an example for so many people to follow. And uh, I thank you guys for, and Google.org for inviting me to this campus for me to share my vision, to share my work, my experience, and uh, maybe what I was able to translate to you today can be replicated as an example for each one of you to go out to do also set an example in a world that we are living in. And it has been my challenge for each one of you in a room everywhere I go speak. Don't leave this hurt without touching somebody else's life. 
go out as you leave this room today. Go and touch somebody and be an example for somebody else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dikembe Matumbo. That was amazing.